Mother's Day, Tracy here, and welcome to City Church Online. We are so glad you're here. If it's your first time watching, thanks for joining us. If you're watching live, play along. If you're watching after the broadcast, please feel free to skip ahead to Sunday Online. Catch up with some of your friends or make new ones. As we honor mothers today, take this time to share a memory of a special mom or woman in your life in the comment section. time together? I know I am. Why don't you invite your friends through social media? Take time right now. Now. <laughs> Please share on your pages and make sure you tag City Church on Facebook and through Instagram at Love Hope City. is for everyone who is not a mom. That's right. Moms, if we can please ask you to leave the room for about 90 seconds. Don't worry, we'll get you back before worship begins. Okay, it's just us, right? Oh good. Dads, older siblings, relatives, friends. Here's a fun and easy gift that you can make for that special mom in your life. Hit it, Krizel. Hey guys, need a last minute gift idea to do with your kids? 
Have fun and get creative. Get any old shirt, line it up, and lay it flat. Grab your scissors and begin by removing the bottom border and cutting two inch strips down below. You can then remove the sleeves and the neck. Flip that shirt inside out. Tie it together front to back. And honestly, after you've done that, you could end right here or flip it around and use the excess for a braided handle. You're all done. For an added bonus, you can use the sleeves, put it around your neck, and you've got yourself a homemade mask. You're ready to go grocery shopping. Any mom would appreciate this gift idea, especially when made with love. Enjoy. Grab your Bible and, of course, have a cup of coffee nearby. Get ready for worship and to hear a message from Pastor Kyle. Thanks for joining us, and we're so glad you're here. Hey, 
Hey, good morning, City Church. Good morning, City Church. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Ours is special this year because on May 6th, we added this guy to our family. His name is Elliot James. And so far, he's amazing. He's just getting busy with his pacifier. <laughs> but um, we appreciate what you mothers do to create these. <laughs> <laughs> And we hope that you have a great day today, and I hope that all of you watching now enjoy the service. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day! Hey guys, Pastor Kyle here. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms, aunties, grandmas, spiritual mentors out there. We're so glad that you joined us. Also, happy Mother's Day to my wife, the best mom on earth. Yes, I'm biased, and yes, it is still a fact. Uh, happy Mother's Day to my mom and my mother-in-law. Got to make sure to throw those in there as well. And uh, with that being said, we are so glad that you're here today. And we want to encourage every single one of you watching this right now to fill out a worship response right here and right now. Grab your phone and go to lovehopecity.com forward slash response and fill it out in its entirety. If there's anything that you're interested in, any boxes that are relevant, something you want to know about, we would love to know about that. And most importantly, we would love to pray for you. Fill out that spot in the bottom for prayer requests there. And uh, while you're filling that out, we are going to go ahead and transition to our time of offering. And if you have been blessed by the ministry of City Church, we want to encourage you to get involved in the game of trusting God with your finances. It is the greatest journey other than salvation that you will ever trust the Lord with in your life. And so you can give in one of three very simple ways. Number one, you can give via the web at lovehopecity.com forward slash give. It's simple, easy, and secure, and uh, it just takes a few minutes to input your information. So you can do it that way, but our personal easiest way that we know of to give is the Church Center app. So you download the Church Center app, you identify City Church as your church, and then again, same thing, it just takes a few minutes to input your information, and once that's done, it is so easy and so simple to give. And if the techie stuff is a little too complex for you, you can give the old school way via the snail mail by mailing a letter to City Church, P.O. Box 587, Anaheim, California, 92815. Thank you so much for your continued generosity. Enjoy the rest of the service. Night has fallen, when fear is coming, still you're calling me. When faith is lost and my hope exhausted, you will be my strength. When my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me. Yeah, I've decided.
son and a daughter and four granddaughters. My name is Joan. I have six children, 11 grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. My name is Delcia. I have seven children. I have 21 grandchildren. What I remember about my first child was that she weighed 10 pounds and 11 ounces. Well, I didn't have a first child. I had twins, so I started out with two which was a big surprise. I remember that I was afraid I was gonna kill him. I was afraid I might accidentally drop him or accidentally do something that would hurt him. Thank God I didn't kill him or anybody else. When they first brought him to show him to me and they held this little red-headed boy up, I loved him so much. I didn't know there was a love like you could feel for that child. With the addition of each child, I was a year older because they came fast. I had seven children in the span of six years and I remember changing a whole lot of diapers. I think my first Mother's Day was in the sanctuary right over behind us because this is where we were attending church and I remember taking the baby to the nursery in this church. They drew pictures everywhere on their shoes, <laughs> on the counters under the counter, on the walls. They were artistic. Then of course, when I had my third one, it was my girl. And I lay there that morning and I kept saying, it's a girl, Lord, thank you, it's a girl. I love my boys, but it was nice to have both. My youngest son was working at the register and all of a sudden I noticed that he wasn't going out to party, uh, but he was sitting at home reading the Bible. So I asked him, hey, what happened? And he told me that he had uh, someone at work talk to him about Jesus, and that's why he was reading the Bible. I had been a Catholic, and as a young child, I always worried that I could never do enough to gain my way to heaven. And he told me, all you need to just believe in Jesus. Believe that Jesus already paid that price, and so that sounded good to me. Well. My youngest son had a hard time and he got on drugs and I fought with everything I had to get him out of that. And I think my faith grew so much during that time. I credit the experience I had with him during those years with the faith that I have now. God's presence in my life grew stronger. I thank him for that now. He's been well over 20 years, had a job, raised his family, and I thank God for that. When I said that prayer, it seemed to me that the whole world lit up, and that was the answer. Absolutely, I'm very thankful for my son introducing the Lord to me. What I would tell my younger self is that I need to spend more intentional time with my kids, um, juggling a teaching job and the after-school stuff that goes with it, and the time spent with my kids was the most valuable and what I remember the best. I would tell my younger self, don't fret, don't worry, just take things as they happen, enjoy life, enjoy your children, relax. I would tell my younger self how important it is to have daily devotion with your children. Being a mother is hard work. It's not easy. It's, they say when, you're, when they're young, they break your back, and when they get older, they break your heart. 
And if you don't stay close to the Lord, if you don't have your daily devotions and stay close to Him, no way are you going to succeed because there comes your strength and your knowledge of how to be a good mother. So that's, that's the big advice that I would have is stay close to the Lord.
Today, I want to talk about lasting living in a lacking world. You know, more or less, our society has been accustomed to getting what we want when we want it, haven't we? And even though things are still available out there, that whole right here, right now world is becoming more and more challenging these days. In our home, it looks like being more aware of expiration dates than we have ever been before, from milk to meat to my beloved two cookies before bed every night. I know, don't judge me, I work out. Pre-pandemic, there was this illusion of permanence apart from God that just permeated our society. And I can't say it conclusively, but I would guess that past civilizations might not have been as easily susceptible to that mindset as we are today. See, they knew that their milk supply was only as good as the goats and the cows that they owned. (laughs) They knew that their egg supply was only as good as their chickens that produced them. Living in this Amazon Prime and Costco era, I heard about terms like supply chains, but I really didn't understand how particularly vulnerable they were until they began to become easily broken. We live in a lacking world, and we're all relearning what it means to have lasting living in a lacking world. But to God, the lacking nature of this world is not news at all. God has been speaking about it in the Bible ever since the fall of Adam and Eve. My message titled today on Mother's Day of 2020 is Lasting Living in a Lacking World. I've been a Christian for 23 years. I know the Word. I know the Lord. I got a degree in biblical studies as an undergraduate. I got a master's degree in theology in the Bible. I've been in ministry since I was 15 years old, and I've been the senior pastor of this church, Lisa, and I started since I was 25 years old. I don't share all those things to toot my own horn. In fact, quite the opposite. I share it because with all that, you would think that I have this constant awareness of the impermanence of this world. But guess what? I don't. I'm just like you. You know, I want to enjoy the life that God's given me, and that's a good thing. We should enjoy life, but we will never be fully and finally satisfied on this side of heaven. My earthly body is constantly looking for fulfillment and hope here. You know, day by day, I just keep learning that this is a hopelessly lacking place. And this pandemic brought the temporary nature of this life to my heart in a way that I don't believe I've ever experienced before. Now, don't get me wrong. I have been through tremendous hardship and loss, just like every one of you watching this before this situation. I teach about the fact that there's no guarantees in life on this side of heaven other than the fact that Jesus is our Lord and we have hope through him. I teach about that every Sunday. And so just like you, I know this life is lacking. I know this life is temporary. But when things are good and things are going well, that just kind of slips into the background of my thoughts of something that I'll need in the distant future. Well, it's front and center here now, isn't it? I wonder if that's true for you as much as it is for me these days. I suspect it is. Well, simply put, I think we're all relearning what it means to live for that which is lasting in this very lacking world. And when I say that we're relearning to live for that which is lasting, I'm talking about eternity. Hey, open up a Bible to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 25. We're going to pick up where Pastor Willie left off last week. I have loved this book of 1 Peter in this COVID-19 pandemic era because it is all about how to endure in the midst of a storm. So we're going to pray together, and then we're going to read the scriptures together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that there is hope in the storm. We thank you that you are present in our trials, and you care about us, and you're walking with every one of us step by step. I want to pray right now that you would open our eyes to see what you want us to see from your word, that you would open our ears to hear what you want us to hear from it, and most importantly, that you'd open our hearts that we'd respond and become the disciples you want us to be as a result of it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 1 Peter 1, 13 through 25 says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. 
And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with imperishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this is the good news that was preached to you. You know, this section of scripture that I just read to you can be divided into two main categorical themes. And the first one is the impermanent, lacking nature of this world where we live today. And the second part can be categorized as the calling on every believer's life to live for that which is lasting and eternal. So I'd like to share with you three things that every Christian can expect living in a lacking world, because that's where we live. We live in a lacking world. The first insight about how to do that is to expect continual reminders that life on earth stinks sometimes, and heaven is every believer's true hope and true home. Verse 13 starts out mentioning that every Christian ought to set their hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What is that grace? It's what happens either when we die or when the Lord returns, salvation. It's gonna be amazing. It's the whole reason we study the Bible, that we go to church, that we do everything in our power to bring as many people into the kingdom of heaven as possible. Peter says that is the only place we will find lasting hope. We'll get glimmers of goodness on this side of heaven. I can think of a lot of amazing experiences from my own life, like graduating college, getting married, starting this church, having kids. There's so many more that I couldn't even begin to start to mention. Those are there as glimmers of hope on this side of heaven. Because a lot of life on this side of heaven stinks, doesn't it? Now, I don't want to ask you for an amen here, but my guess is you probably would agree with that. We should expect continual life reminders that this is not our home. Heaven is the true home of every believer. And when we look to things here to find lasting hope, we're always going to come up empty. So now let me jump down to verses 24 to 25 before I cover the middle section of the text. Peter starts this section with verse 13, focusing on eternity. And verses 12 through 23, focusing on lasting living. And then Peter kind of bookends verses 24 to 25 by focusing again on the hope of eternity. And it's almost like Peter was using the literary structure to remind us that number one, focus on heaven. Number two, live like it. And number three, focus on heaven. I've used verses 24 and 25 in memorial services before because they remind us that our lives are just temporary vessels on the way to an eternal dwelling. It says all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Peter was quoting from Isaiah 40 verses six through eight here. And you know, last week, Willie mentioned that Peter was written or that the book of First Peter was written to a group of scattered and battered people. You know, the same thing was true for Isaiah, who originally wrote these words. He was also writing to a group of scattered and battered Israeli exiles. So let's read what Isaiah said here that Peter quotes. And actually, there's a part that Peter doesn't quote in Isaiah 47. This is the way Isaiah phrases it. He says, the grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are the grass. Did you catch that? Who are you and I in the illustration from Peter and Isaiah? We're the grass. We're the thing that comes and goes. God, heaven, and his word are the only permanent realities that exist. You know, in my backyard, I got some spots where the grass is dying 
and it doesn't grow very well. It's browning. You know, what does it mean when grass starts to brown? It means it's dying. It means that its existence is temporary. Well, guess what? This is you. This is me. We are the grass. We are already dying. We're already living in an imperfect, flawed vessel. And the hope of this text is that heaven is our true home. Yes, we will shed this outer shell. But you know what? This whole coronavirus pandemic, it's just the latest and arguably most painful reminder in recent memory that life on earth stinks sometimes. And heaven is every believer's true hope and their true home. You know, the next insight that I'd like to point out from 1 Peter 1, 13 through 25 is that believers should decide to let God use the stinky circumstances to set you apart. We should expect life to stink on this side of heaven sometimes. But, you know, that mindset in and of itself is kind of negative and somewhat fatalist. See, the Christian life is all about overcoming evil with good, isn't it? The Christian life is all about triumphing over whatever negative circumstances are around us. The Christian life is about victorious living. And so that means, you know, I might have adversity on this side of heaven, but I know in the end, adversity doesn't win. Jesus won. He continues to win. And because Jesus already won, I can decide now that I'm not going to let the negative win today. I'm going to let God take the stinky situation I'm dealing with and turn it to good. I'm going to ask God how he wants to use that stinky situation to set me apart, to refine me, to purify me. Verse 15 says, God expects us to be holy because he is holy. Now, what does it mean to be holy? To be holy means to have no sin. To have no sin literally means to be like God, and this is absolutely terrifying. It's also impossible. See, Peter is pointing us to the fact that only Jesus lived a sinless, holy life. We're not holy. We're messed up. We're holy only because Jesus paid the price for our holiness with his blood shed on the cross. And because of what Jesus has done for us, All who simply receive him by faith are imputed his righteousness and his holiness. We will never achieve the holiness of God, no matter how hard we try. It's a free gift to all who call upon Jesus as Lord. And yet, verses 13 through 15 are dedicated to reminding believers of our calling to be holy as God himself is holy. And that word holy simply means to be set apart. And in the wording of my message title today, I would say that holy living is lasting living. Holy living is how we let God use the stinky circumstances of this world to set us apart and become more like Jesus. We're supposed to be different. In a world that doesn't walk with the Lord, we are to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. In a world that says whatever goes, God says whatever he says goes. First Peter deals with the topic of trials repeatedly. In fact, it seems Peter is saying that trials and hardships are one of the key things that God uses to set believers apart. There are a couple of different translations of the Bible I want to read that unpack this idea of holy, lasting living in this lacking world. You know, the first one is the message translation of 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16, and it says it this way. It says, don't lazily slip back into those old grooves of evil, doing just what you feel like doing. You didn't know any better then, you do now. I love that visual of an old groove. You know, I got a sliding door at my house and it gets stuck all the time right now because of some old grooves. It's not the end of the world, it's just a pain in the butt when you need to open it and move it. But once a groove is notched into something, it's easy for something to get stuck on it and and for it to be challenging to move that object. Just like my sliding door can easily get stuck on an old groove, so can your life. Old thought patterns can be old grooves. Old girlfriends or old boyfriends can be old grooves. Old ways of talking can be old grooves. Old ways of thinking can be old grooves. Old fights in your marriage can be old grooves. Peter says, don't lazily slip back into old grooves of evil doing just whatever you feel like doing. You didn't know any better back then, 
you do now. You know, I also like the good news translation of 1 Peter 1, 14 that says, be obedient to God and do not allow your lives to be shaped by those desires you had when you were still ignorant. We all have sinful desires. They just shouldn't shape our lives. I also like the message translation of 1 Peter 1, 17 that says, you call out to God and he helps. He's a good father in that way, but don't forget, he's also a responsible father and won't let you get by with sloppy living. Sloppy living happens when we don't let God use the stinky circumstances of earth to set us apart. I also love how the English Standard Version of the Bible, which is the one I most prominently teach from, puts 1 Peter 1.17 when it says this, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Simply put, our time of exile is our time on planet earth. These aren't the good old days that we'll talk about when we get to heaven. These are the days we'll remember as a past dream that pales in comparison to the joy and the hope that we're living when we're truly home with the Lord. Hey guys, so I got some bad news for all of us right now. Here it is. Life is still gonna stink after the coronavirus ends. It will. It's a perpetual thing that we'll always deal with until the day that we meet Jesus. But here's the good news for you and I. We can decide to let God use the stinky circumstances of earth to refine us and set us apart. And as God does that, we're gonna look more and more like Jesus and a little bit more like we will in heaven, like the Lord wants us to. Here's the final insight that I have for us today on what it means to live for that which is lasting in this lacking world. And here it is. The Christian is never done learning to love. You know, verse 22 says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, that's holy living that we've been talking about today, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. The whole point of holy living isn't about us boasting about how righteous we are. In fact, if we're doing that, the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, that we're a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. The whole point of holy living is that we learn to love one another from a pure heart. I'm always amazed by the Bible. It seems like it just cuts straight to the heart of whatever we're going through in life. And if Peter had stopped at love one another earnestly, that still would have been a really good thought. But you know, Peter took it on one level deeper, saying that we are to love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Here's why I love that Peter included this insight. See, it's easy to love someone outwardly and even appear to be doing so earnestly. As human beings, we quickly learn to bite our tongues and mask our expressions sometimes. And God tells us here, that's not good enough. We need to love earnestly from a pure heart. And for me to love someone from a pure heart, I have to have worked through my issues towards them. And you know, only God can help a person do that. The perpetual process of healing that God does in a believer's life so they can love from a pure heart is supernatural. We are all relearning what it means to love right now. We are all relearning what it means to love God. We are all relearning what it means to love one another. We are all relearning what it means to love our families. We are all relearning what it means to love our church family. We are all relearning what it means to love our neighbors. We are all relearning to love video chatting. We are all relearning what it means to love and appreciate what we have. We are relearning to appreciate when we can get our hands on a hot commodity like toilet paper, disinfectant wipes, or meat. We are relearning the simple life. We are relearning the power of stillness. We are relearning the need to do our best to stay healthy as much as we can so we can make an impact on this side of heaven for as long as God would allow. We are relearning so many things these days aren't we? Why do I keep adding that word relearning in front of things? It's because these were things we all knew about before, but man, it sure seems like we're discovering them in a deeper way these days, doesn't it? We are relearning to love all over again. 
And the Christian is never done learning to love. See, it was the Lord who once reminded us that all of the Bible can be summed down to this phrase, love God and love people. This coronavirus pandemic is simply a new way for us to continually learn what it means to do that. It's a new set of circumstances that reaffirm the age-old truth of the Bible. You know, we're living in a lacking world. God calls the Christian to seek out and find that which is lasting and eternal in the midst of it. Simply put, God is asking you and I to practice lasting living in this lacking world. And we do that by continually learning what it means to love. We do that by letting God use the stinky circumstances of earth to set us apart as his chosen and holy people. And we do that by continually reminding ourselves that life on earth stinks sometimes and heaven is our true hope and our true home. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the hope of heaven. We ask that every single day we'd be more mindful of it. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you're watching this broadcast right now and you genuinely don't know whether you would go to heaven when you pass away, I believe beyond a shadow of doubt that God brought you to this today to settle that question once and for all. I wanna tell you that God promises to do four things for you. He promises to forgive you of all your sins, past, present, and future. He promises to adopt you into his family and call you his own son or daughter. He promises to fill you with the spirit so you can live the life that he's called you to live. And finally, he promises an eternal life to you that's beyond anything that you could ask for, or dream, or imagine. There's only one catch. Jesus wants the steering wheel of your heart. And so if you're ready to step over the line and become a Jesus follower, I want you to pray with me. It isn't mystical. It isn't magical. God hears the faith in your heart. Pray this prayer with me if that's you. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin and the sins of the world. I believe you died there and I believe you rose from the grave so I could have everlasting life. Lord, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Fill me with your spirit and give me the power to live this life for you. God, I'm tired of running. Here's the steering wheel of my heart. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
as you go, we do live in a lacking world, but it doesn't mean that we can't create lasting memories here and now today. It doesn't mean that this life is meaningless. In fact, quite the opposite. This life is so meaningful because God has allowed us to be here to make an impact for Him. It may seem like a weird time to make an impact for God, but God has placed you where you are today to bless people, to love on your family, and to live for that which is lasting. We'll see you guys next week. Have a great week. Bye, guys.